talked last week about the rapture of the church. We're in a series about living in the last days. And, and we, the first week we talked about Daniel's 70th week uh, prophecy. And so we're 483 years into that and then Jesus showed up on the scene. And when Jesus showed up on the scene, that clock stopped. And so now the next seven years, that last seven years of determined time for Israel, we call that the tribulation. The last three and a half years of that uh, tribulation period we call the Great Tribulation, and that is about to come upon the people of the earth. And we learned last week that the rapture of the church, we will not be here. So the progression is, we have the church age right now. And if you were to see the end, we're, we're right at the end of the church age. You know, today, literally for about 39 more minutes, we are at the last 39 minutes of the Feast of Trumpets for this year. So if, if I'm preaching and we hear a trumpet and we're out of here, that will be fine with me. I'm sure the Lord will let me finish this sermon, maybe, or maybe we might just forget about that when we see Jesus, right? But you know, if, if, that, is, if that does not happen, there's a really good chance that we could have another year, at least. We, you know, we don't know. For my wife and I, for the last several years, we just live our life that every Feast of Trumpets, we're like, okay, Lord, we're ready, we're looking, you know, and we just want to see you. But man, when it's over, we're like, okay, let's just win more people to Christ. Let's just be about the master's business. I don't know about you, you know, uh, as I've talked to friends of mine and different things, you know, we all kind of feel that we might have uh, a few, I, I was saying a few years left, and I don't know, you know, um, I thought maybe if I saw 2023 here, I would be shocked. Now knowing the Hebrew calendar goes on a seven-year cycle, so the next year, the next Jew Feast of Trumpets or the next Jewish New Year, that will fall on September 6th through 8th. The Jewish New Year, uh, that will be a Shemitah year. So the Jewish calendar is on a seven-year cycle. The seventh year is a Sabbath year. They call it a Shemitah year. So that, that, that even, that really gets your attention uh, if you look at end time prophecy. But regardless, how we live our life as Christians is we live our life ready to meet him. So today I want to talk about preparing. How do you prepare to meet him? You know, Jesus literally gave us a whole chapter in Matthew about, he gave us two parables and one story talking about how we can prepare, what we need to do to meet him. And we'll talk about that today. As the Lord leads us, you know, I, I have so many notes, and the Lord just told me this morning to just keep them at home. So we're just going to flow this morning, because I, I just know that, you know, the way he is, the Holy Spirit just gives us exactly what we need. But we live our life, and we, we plan as if we are going to live out our days and, and pass from this earth and go be with him. That's how we plan. But we live like he's coming back today, right? I, I, really, I really have a strong opinion, I'll say, about the Feast of Trumpets being the next feast day that's fulfilled in the rapture of the church. But you know what? I'm not as strong in that as I am in salvation and faith and principles, things that are laid out in the Bible, because I could maybe be seeing that wrong. So who knows, maybe in October he'll come. I don't know, right? But I do know this, we need to be ready. Now it's amazing what's happening in the earth today. Amazing what's happening in the earth. You look at the parable of the fig tree. We might go into that. I, I don't know if we will or not. But the parable of the fig tree, it talks about when Israel becomes a nation. And really, it's really, it's really crazy when you look at Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied that Israel would, would be brought back a second time to become a nation. But the second time, it, Israel would become a nation in one day. And, and first of all, there's never been a nation on the earth that was conquered, that came back a second time. Until May of 1948. And in one day, Israel became a nation. 
and the fig tree. That's the parable of the fig tree. Then in 1967, Jerusalem was taken over. The Bible said, Jesus said this, the generation that sees this will not pass until everything is fulfilled, which means all the way to the second coming. So Jesus comes, takes the church out of here. Then there's this conflict on the earth where all these nations, Russia and, uh, and, a, and a Turkey, I mean, all these nations come against Israel. It's a one-day war. God protects them supernaturally. And by the way, every nation is in Israel, I around Israel right now. Thousands of missiles pointed at them. Russia has now built nine bases. They're fortifying them every day. Turkey is saying all this stuff. Iran is saying all this stuff. It's amazing. Just last week, the uh, Saudi, uh, the Arab Emirates is what they call it, these nations that were spoken of in the Bible that would stand with Great Britain and the United States and go, hey, Russia, what are you doing? Why are you invading Israel? Well, as of like last week, those, Saudi, those, those Arab nations made a, a, a pact with Israel. They're at peace with Israel. That's never, so that, and when you read the Bible, that's Dedan. So it fulfills those nations. Everything is in place for that conflict. So that conflict will happen. The Bible says, literally, uh, God will protect Israel. Now, if you look at Israel, I think it's the size of New Jersey. The whole nation. And they are surrounded by everybody who wants them off the planet. It's really amazing. So, so you have that, and then after that Ezekiel 38 conflict, there will come a, a man who will make a seven-year peace treaty with Israel. That will be the Antichrist. The Bible calls him the Assyrian, the son of perdition. And they will go into a tribulation period. The Jewish people will think that he is their Messiah. So they're going to be excited about it. Now, if you study the book of Revelation, man, every time this guy turns around, what he wants is just, he's just getting punched in the face by Jesus constantly. And his kingdom's kind of a mess, but midway through the tribulation period. So now, what happens? Let me back up. So you have the rapture of the church. You have this Ezekiel 38 war. It's been amazing the last, I think, 10 or 15 years. National Geographic was the first ones to notice this. But predatory birds have been migrating into this area where this battle would be fought. The Bible says that God will call the fowls of the air to clean up the bodies of all the dead. And they noticed it when there was about 46 or 47 new species of predatory birds that just for some reason came in and started multiplying in that area. Today there's 170 some new species of predatory birds that are multiplying in that specific area. What God's like calling them, getting them ready to, eat, to feed on the bodies, to clean up these bodies. They will also clean up the bodies of the of Battle of Armageddon when Jesus comes back a second time. But as soon as we're out of here, I believe there will be a short period of time. This, this war will take place. A short period of time will happen. Eventually, a treaty will be signed. We'll go into the tribulation period. The moment the rapture of the church happens, right at the beginning of the tribulation, the Bible says that there's 144,000 Jews. No doubt, these will be Jewish people that are not saved, but have heard the gospel. And when all this stuff happens, they're like, oh my gosh, they get born again. The Bible says they become world evangelists and they evangelize the world, and then midway through the tribulation, when the temple is rebuilt, the Antichrist will sit in the Holy of Holies and proclaim himself as God and start to try to eradicate the Jewish people. That's when the mark of the beast will come. All that technology is here right now, where you get a mark in your hand. They call it a quantum tattoo. 
It's tied to a vaccine. It's all right there right now. There's even a lot of talk by some people that are saying, you know, this vaccine is so important that no, we should give people a certificate that says that nobody can buy or sell unless they have this vaccine to protect people from viruses and things like that. So that's already, what is that? That's a precursor. You know, that will eventually evolve into the mark of the beast. We won't be here. But midway through the tribulation period, it's real interesting that people will have to take that mark. Well, it's amazing that right after that point, you see this great sea of people before the throne of God in heaven. What that is, is that's the mid-trib rapture. That's why a lot of people teach the raptures in the middle. Well, yeah, there is a mid-trib rapture. It's the 144,000 Jews and all the people that got saved all over the world. They're taken out. But now, the second half, what happens, as soon as the 144,000 are taken out, notice that even in a time where God's pouring out his wrath on the earth, judging the sin of the earth, even while he's doing that, he always makes a way for people because his heart is that people turn to him. He's like, man, I've been, I, I've been operating in grace with you guys for 2,000 years of a church age, and, and if that doesn't work, I've got seven more years, and I'm gonna just, I mean, people on this planet will be cursing God. The Bible, it's amazing. They will know that the stuff that's happening, they're being judged by God, but they still won't turn. It's, it's unreal. So glad I'm not gonna be here. Right? And you know, like when I go to a sporting event, man, when I was in the sporting goods industry, you know, if I'm gonna go to an NBA game, I wanna be close to the floor, right? If I go to a football game or wherever, I like, to, if I go to church, I wanna be in the front row. One reason is because I don't want anybody to have to listen to me sing during worship. That, that's just not gonna bless them. But the other reason, I like to be in the middle of things. But I'm so glad I will be in the balcony during that tribulation period. I'll be in heaven going, wow, right? So during that, but in, as soon as the 144,000 are taken out, as soon as the rapture of the, all these believers, all these saints happen, now you've got the great tribulation that's starting and there will be two witnesses that will come back. A lot of people believe it's probably Enoch and Elijah. You know, I, I, I feel very strongly one of them's Elijah because it says that, so they can change weather patterns. Well, you see that in the life of Elijah. But we don't know the names of those. That's just speculation. However, when they come, we'll know. Right? We'll be like Enoch, Eli, man, dude. I'm glad I'm not you, right? Because they're going to come down. We'll be saying, well, see you guys in a little bit. See you in three and a half years. And they'll go down and they will evangelize the world. And then the Bible says that the angels of God will be commissioned and they will fly through the sky proclaiming the gospel to people too. Could you imagine? How would you like to have like an event? Like we have a church picnic. We were last night, we had over 100 people there. We're just having fun. We have this big pavilion and these bonfires. Wouldn't it have been cool if there would have been like three or four angels just kind of hovering above us going, hey, come on in. These people, they're the sons of God. They'll tell you about how to know Jesus. I wonder how that would have impacted that picnic last night, right? We might have had to have eight services today, which excites me. It, it excites a lot of these pastors in here too. Because when I fall out, then they would just grab the Bible and go, right? So, so I mean, it's going to be awesome. That's going to be happening. So there will still be people getting saved. Most of those people saved, though, will be martyred for their faith. The Antichrist, the Bible says, is given power to prevail against the saints. So he will be trying to stop the church, or not the church, that the church age is over, but the saints. They're still our brothers and sisters. It's just no longer the church age. And that will go until the second coming at the end of the tribulation period, well, three days before the end of the seven-year period, power will be given to the Antichrist to kill the two witnesses. The Bible says, how evil is this, right? The Bible says that their bodies will lay dead in the street 
and the whole world will see them. Well, we know with technology right now, you're right, CNN, all the news, they'll be right there, right? And the Bible says that people in the earth are so happy that they're dead, that they give gifts, they're partying and all this stuff, but then three days, all of a sudden they get up and that's the third rapture and they are, they are taken out. So could you imagine all the cameras are on them and all of a sudden after you're dead for three days, they get up. People be like, yeah, you can just imagine, right? Something happens in the country right now and it's all over the news all the time. That's gonna be all over the news, especially when they get up. Camera will be close. They'll even see in slow motion when they open their eyes. Stand up and then they keep going. And they just, they just go. And then as people are going, wow. All of a sudden the sky is gonna roll back. It's really interesting how now in the study of space, they say that, that space is like a big curtain. Well, God's going to roll that back, and there's going to be Jesus. The second coming, we're going to be with him. But he's not coming as the Lamb of God. No, no, he's coming as the Word of God. And this is the Battle of Armageddon. I've seen the Valley of Megiddo in Israel. It's a huge valley. They say that in this battle, which is a very short battle, the Bible says sword comes out of Jesus' mouth. In other words, he speaks, and they're all done. It says the blood will flow to the horse's bridle, which is about four feet, about four feet, in the whole valley, right? That's crazy. And then after that, Jesus will come to this earth and he will set his feet on the Mount of Olives. It's really amazing because the Bible says the Mount of Olives will split in a great earthquake when his feet hit, and it will literally go all the way to the Dead Sea. Right now, on the Mount of Olives, they can't even build around that area because there's a major fault line. Well, that, it will never have an earthquake. It's waiting for the King of Kings' feet, right? And Jesus will establish his kingdom on this earth. We'll be with him. We'll rule and reign with him for a thousand years. And so all these things, this is kind of a recap of the book of Revelation. want to encourage you, if you want to really understand the book of Revelation, I'm a pastor, so I taught a verse-by-verse -verse study through this. And, and basically it's coming from the, the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not a revelation of the Antichrist. It's not a revelation of what Satan's doing. It's a revelation that Jesus is greater than anything that you will ever face, and his kingdom will never end. And we really go into that, and you can understand there's some keys to understand the book. It's so funny how everybody goes, this is the book we can't understand, and yet out of all the books of the Bible, it's the only one called the revealing of Jesus Christ. And there's actually a blessing associated with reading and heeding and doing what it says. What do you mean? How do you do the book of Revelation? You walk through your life and whenever you face something, you look at it and go, I thank you, Jesus, that that is not greater than you. As I walk through this life and the kingdom of darkness tries to stop me from advancing, I say, no, the kingdom of God will never not advance. That's how we live and that's how we move, right? So anyway, so this is the recap. I want to encourage you to get on our app. That series, uh, I think I took 28 weeks to talk about the book of Revelation. It was, we had a great time with that. Um, you can learn more about that. I, I want to encourage you, as a believer, this is not to be something that consumes your life. But this is something that you need to know, right? Right now we're 21 minutes away from Rosh Hashanah being over, which means we could possibly have another 12 months to win a lot of people to Christ. Why not a great revival? I mean, our, how, do you know people? Do you know anybody who's not saved? Right? I do. I don't want them to go through the tribulation. I don't want them to die and never know Jesus, 
right? So God, know this. You know, even this year, this year's been kind of crazy, hasn't it? But I got to tell you, the Lord has been all over me about you keep your eyes on me and you keep my word in your mouth. Because if I start thinking about stuff, I can't stand the mask thing because I like to look at people. I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a hugger, I'm a toucher. You know, I'm like a big teddy bear that way. I don't, it just, I, I, have, to, I have to not focus on that because it frustrates me, it distracts me from my purpose. So I've let all that go. Sometimes I have to watch the movie Frozen with my grandkids. Let it go, let it go, right? <laughs> Keep the word of God in my mouth. But you know, here's the thing. You will see by the end of this year, when Jeanette and I came back from Hawaii, the thing that exploded in our hearts is we will not go backwards this year as a church. And I don't believe we have. I, I just believe people have grown, people have increased. I, I, so we're, we're expecting, we're expecting an awakening and a revival. And to, I mean, God has a big plan for Omaha and the surrounding region. He has a huge plan. And here's the thing. He created you and placed everything in you for such a time as this. He chose us to live at the end of this age. I mean, expect that. As we're sitting here today, probably not one of us are going to have to die physically. We're just going to be changed. We're going to meet Jesus very soon. So how do we prepare for that? Let's go to Luke chapter 18. Let's just jump off here. Luke chapter 18, I've got so many scriptures, but we'll just take our time and we'll just do what the Lord wants. This is the only one he gave me. Luke chapter 18, I want you to look at the second half of verse 8. Luke chapter 18 and verse 8. It's, I'll just read the whole verse. It says, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. And now he's talking about, I won't go into the whole context of this, but this is a statement that he, that he says. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? It's a question. Well, you know, I want to answer that question, yes, when he comes for the church, I want him to find us walking by faith, right? So I want to, you know, I wrote down here, and I actually put it here so I didn't have to, have to I, I just like to keep these notes in my Bible, uh, and then whenever these, these polls change, I just pull it out and put the new one in. But George Barna, he does a lot of research, Christian, it's a Christian research firm, and he polls people in the church or Christians. Well, I should say this. People either people who are Christians or who think they are, okay? People who are in the church. Because, guys, we're living in a time where many have departed from the faith. We're living in such a watered-down church environment that there's so many people that are calling themselves Christians that are not born again. And, and so what's interesting... You know, we, we talked about this. We're going to see, I, I believe we'll go to Matthew, um, but we're going to see about how that there's 10 virgins, five are taken and five are left. You know, and, and it, it, it almost denotes that, that when the rapture of the church happens, we could possibly see half of all church-going people that are sitting in pews and sitting in seats, half of them, not go because they're not born again. The first, the first requirement to going in the rapture, and really it's the only requirement, is you must be born again. It's not enough to believe that Jesus is God. The Bible says the demons believe that, but they never act on that belief. They never obey God. And faith without corresponding action is dead. It's lifeless, it's inactive. So not only must you believe in your heart that Jesus rose from the dead, 
as the King of kings, the Lord of lords, as Lord of all, but then you have to confess with your mouth what you believe in your heart, that Jesus, you are my Lord. I believe you're Lord of all, and today I proclaim that you're my Lord. You're acting on your face, faith. When that happens, you get born again. And those, everyone who's born again, as we talked about last week, will go in the rapture. But there will be many that think they're okay, but they've never given their heart to Christ. You know, there's many people that call themselves Christians that literally never read or study their Bible. And God's word says you can't separate God from his word. They, 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 they don't care. I'm a Christian, but I never go to church. Doesn't matter. I, I just, I won't do it. I want to live my life and do my thing. Man, I, you know, my prayer, I, or not my prayer, my hope is that they're just carnal Christians. You know, but there's a lot in the Bible that talks about that possibly half of the people that think they're Christians will not go. So let's, even George Barnum, look at what he says here. This is a recent poll. Half of Christians polled believe that you can attain salvation by being or doing good. Have you ever witnessed anybody? And, and, and you know, well, why, so why would you think that God should let you into his heaven? And they say, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a good person. Right? That, that's, that's not going to get you there. So then, now, you got to understand this poll. So this poll, 70% of Catholics believe that you could attain salvation by being good. 44% of mainline Protestants, the mainline denominations, believe that you can attain salvation by being good. That's, that's amazing. Because these are, these are people that are hearing the word, but they don't know it. 41%, now that's huge, of evangelicals polled said they believed you could attain salvation just by being good. But us Pentecostals, you know, us tongue talkers, man, we're so much better than these denominational people, and right? 46%, we beat both of those categories. 46% of Pentecostals polled said that you could attain salvation apart from Jesus just by being good. These are 46% that are sitting in our pews. 50, if you take all that, 50%. Isn't it amazing that Jesus said this, told parables about it, 19, almost 2,000 years later, this is the statistic. Let's talk about America. We should, we should both be saddened by this, it should cause us to pray, and we should be excited about this because of the revival that it could birth. 58% of Americans polled Believe that there is no absolute truth. No absolute moral truth. It does not exist. That the basis of truth are factors or sources other than God. In other words, so many believe truth is what I think it is. 77 77% of Americans believe right and wrong is determined by factors other than the Bible. 77%. So do you know how many people, those people would consider themselves Christians? 59% of Americans believe that the Bible is not God's authoritative true word. Now, this is kind of, see, this is the deception. So if you look at Portland, Oregon, one of the most liberal cities, right? It's full of atheists, New Age, all this stuff. Well, if they don't believe the Bible's anything, 
Why are they burning it? Do you see the deception? And people that are burning the Bible is not the enemy of the church. It's who's behind that. The deceiver, Satan, right? So we got we to gotta really keep our eye on the ball here as Christians. 69% of Americans polled said that people are basically good. Well, you know, there's some bad people, but, but overall, people are basically good. Right? George Barna came out of this poll and he made this statement, the, the quote from the George Barna, Barna Research Center, I don't know if it was him personally or what, but he said, if you look at some of the dominant elements in the American mind and heart today, most people believe that the purpose of their life is feeling good about themselves. That my purpose in life is to feel good about me. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, he said, in the final days, not the last days, because that started when Jesus came out of the tomb, but in the final days, which are now here now, it said, it said perilous times shall come. Now we would say perilous times are here. What is the number one thing on that list? For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Right? Now, now, lest we get all big and go, well, that's not us. Listen, that whole list is describing a lot of stuff that's going on in the church. Some people have a form of godliness but deny the, the dunamis, the power they're in, right? So we got to be careful with this. So let's go over to Matthew 24. I mentioned this. Matthew chapter 24, I think it's about verse 3. And, and Jesus is asked a question. Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. I hope this kind of wakes you up a little bit and goes, wow. You know, we need to do what? We need to get God involved with this, right? Because he's the vine, we're the branch. We can't do anything without him. So that should spur us to pray. Right? I, if you're a child of God and you have family members that you, you wonder, are they saved, are they not? Listen, what you need to be doing right now, don't get upset at your kids. Don't, don't speak death over them. Listen, start speaking life. When you see them not wanting God, you, Father, I thank you that so-and-so will live long on the earth, will follow you all the days of their life. And start speaking life. I thank you for bringing laborers over their path. People that could connect with them and draw them in. Because I don't know about you, but I think I do know about you. Don't we want all of our kids with us? Right? Well, you know, there's promises that God wants all of our kids with us. So how many of you know he's faithful? The Holy Spirit will find people. So I would start thanking God every day, right? Father, I thank you that my kids are radically saved, that they'll go in the rapture of the church, that they won't have to, they're not going to be in the tribulation. No, they're going to be with me in heaven with you. Amen? Amen. So don't get worried. We don't worry about our kids. Because the Bible, we call those things that be not as though they are. We surround them with faith and with love. We ask for God to protect them. Didn't he say we're righteous? Isaiah 54, all of your children, great will be the peace of your children, and all of your children will be taught of the Lord. So speak that over their life. Do you know to be taught of the Lord? Do you know that God never will teach somebody that doesn't, it's not interested. Like the Lord tells me as a pastor, I am only ministering to people who have ears to hear. I am not even to focus on the other people because they're not listening anyway. So I don't think about that. So actually what I do is I just thank God that everybody has ears to hear, right? It's kind of like if somebody doesn't like me, they just need, it's, it's like being in sales. When I was a national sales manager, the word no all that means to me is you need more information, right? 
Now, Jeanette didn't say no to me when I asked her out, but had she, it would have just been, she meant she needed more information. <laughs> right? So when somebody says, I don't like you, I'm just like, oh, pff, you just need more information. Right? But if, if the Bible says that God's will is that your children be taught and God only teaches the hungry, then that means your children will be hungry. So start saying that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Maybe your parents, maybe your, your, your relatives, whatever. So it says here, let me not get off track here. We only have three hours today. So Matthew chapter 24, it is verse 3. It says, and as he, talking about Jesus, sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? They asked about three questions. Now, we're not going to go in. We went into some of this before. And I don't know if, if this series will go past this week or not. I don't know. But, but we talked about some of this. In the, in the series on the book of Revelation, we talked about all of this. Um, but Jesus starts explaining and answering their questions. But then in chapter 25, Jesus transitions and spends a whole chapter telling two parables and one story about how to be ready. First one is about ten virgins. Right? So, you know, actually, I'm just going to read this. Ten virgins. It says, then shall the kingdom of heaven, this is Matthew 25, verse 1, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept, and at midnight, now this is a verse about the rapture, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish virgins said unto the wise, Give, give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there, not, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Okay? Afterward, now, now Jesus, a parable, he's telling a story that's, that's usually to focus on one point. So don't try to get a whole bunch of doctrine from a parable. Find the point. Okay? It says, the door was shut, 11, verse 11. Afterward came also the other virgin saying, Lord, Lord. Notice the other five were saying, Lord, Lord. In other words, the rapture happened and these, these people who thought they were born again are going, Lord, what, what's going on? Right? We watched a movie one time about the rapture happening on Sunday. You know, there were some pastors left. There was a bunch of people. They were wailing. But that, that guys, that is the... 50% of Christians believe that you don't need Jesus to be saved. You just become a good person. Right? So these people are saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But look at this. But he answered and said, verily, this means in the Greek, most assuredly, I say unto you, I know you not. Jesus said, multitudes will say to me, did you like that siren that went off right there? It's just, I've been practicing that. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> but, but literally think about this. Jesus said, multitudes are going to say to me in that day. Didn't we do this? Didn't we do that? Right? I've heard of preachers that pastored churches for 20 years and they read a book by Kenneth Hagin, and they go to Rhema. And, and while they're at Rhema, they're like, man, I've never heard anything like this. And then they end up getting saved. 
after being a pastor for 20 years. My, the pastor, the church I was going to when I met Jeanette, I was talking to the pastor, he's in heaven now, great man of God, and he was telling me that he was playing golf with a good friend of his who pastored a large church in Southern California. I mean, large, few thousand people. And he's playing golf, and he was telling my pastor, his name was Dick, and he was telling him, he goes, you know, Dick, I'm, I'm doing this funeral. And he goes, man, I just don't know what to say. And Dick's like, you know, I know, funerals are tough. To know what to say, he goes, no, no, you don't understand. I don't know what to say. He goes, I went to Bible school. I went to three years of seminary. I've been in the ministry for years. I don't even know if any of this is true. Not born again. I mean, this is, many will say, Lord, Lord. He's, he answers, I, I know you not. And then it says here, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man comes. That's the rapture. See, Rosh Hashanah, it's over. Right? I think it's so cool, though, that they were able to blow shofars on the Temple Mount this year. That's really cool. So, but anyway, so here we have a situation, a parable. What is the, what, what do we glean? So how do we get ready from these first 13 verses? Here it is. You must know God. To know God, the Bible says, John 17, 3, eternal life is knowing the one true God and Jesus whom he sent. It is being born again. Amen? Amen? Well, how do you get born again? I'm so glad you asked. Right? The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, we've all sinned and we've all come short of the glory of God. But the Bible says... But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus our Lord. And then in Romans it says, if we'll just confess Jesus. Jesus, I believe, right, that you rose from the dead. That you died for my sin, you rose from the dead, are alive today, and now I proclaim with my mouth that you are Lord of all, and today I invite you to be my Lord. You know, the last two weeks in church, we've had people that have, have accepted the Lord. We should always have a lot more accepting the Lord outside of church that we're talking to. But praise God, I can't wait till we get 50 people saved. Hallelujah. So now, verse 14, he's going to tell another story that's going to be on top of this. Now, this is the most important thing that should be born again. But now that you're born again... Here's another thing to prepare. So those of us who are born again now, this is what we do to prepare for his coming. This is another parable. It says in verse 14, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To every man according as his, to his several several ability or according to his ability and straightway took his journey so check this out so this is the story the master gave one man five talents one man two talents one man one talent based on the abilities well we know from reading this in the light of new testament truth according to romans god's given us gifts differing according to the grace given so so why the person that got five, the person that got two, and the person that got one, it's still a level playing field, right? You're going to see this in this story. The person with five is not more important than the person with two, nor the person with one. What's important is what you do with the talents or with your gifts or what you do with what God's called you to do. As we read the story, what does it say? Well, I'll, I'll read it, but what it says is, based on what the person does, they get the reward. So in other words, the second thing that we're going to talk about in preparing is you need to serve the Lord. Right? 
Not only do you get saved, but you start serving God. Right? So we're God's children in our relationship with him, but we're servants as we serve other people. And we only wor work out what he works in, and in reality, we can't even bear fruit unless he bears fruit through us. We're called to do everything with him, not alone. Right? And it says here, then he that received, verse 16, the five talents went and traded with the same and made them five other talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gathered or gained two, another two. <clears throat> but he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants comes and reckons with them. And so he that received five talents came and brought the other five talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Behold, I've gained beside them five talents more. The Lord said unto him, Well done, good, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter, you, enter thou into the joy of the Lord. He that also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered unto me two talents. Behold, I've gained two other talents beside them. Look at the... This is what God said to him. He said the exact same thing. Listen, Billy Graham, Reinhard Bonnke, their ministry, they led millions of people to Christ, but their reward won't be any more than the person who had one or two talents and did everything that God called them to do in the earth. It'll be the same, right? Nothing to brag about. In other words, God loves who you are. Very, very special to him. So then it says here, the Lord said unto him, verse 23, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Then he which had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you have not strawed. Have you ever met anyone who maybe thought they knew God, but they really didn't? And why, why, why would a person not do anything for God? Because they're kind of living for themselves. We're going to see a picture of this guy. It says, and I was afraid and went and hid the talent in the earth, lo, Thou hast what is yours. His Lord answered. So in other words, he gave him the talent back. In other words, this is an individual. In other words, this is an individual that God placed gifts in. He had a plan for his life, but this person did nothing with it. Notice in verse 24, again, this servant who does not know God, right? Never born again. Doesn't, he thinks he knows God. He has a perception of God. He calls him Lord. I knew thee that you're a hard man. Wait, no, no, no. You never knew him if you think he's a hard man, right? So his Lord answered. Now, why would he say his Lord answered? Well, Jesus is Lord of all. And said to him, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I sowed not and gathered where I have not strawed. You ought to therefore put my money into the exchangers and then at my coming I could have received my own with usury. And then it says, therefore take the talent from him and give it to him which has ten talents. For unto everyone that hath shall be given, he that shall have abundance, and he'll have abundance, but to him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we see this servant was not born again. He was never saved. Right? So we have to rightly divide. So the second point, Jesus is saying, listen, you're my child, so now to prepare, you just serve me. How, what, how do I, what do I do that? Well, Philippians tells me, I only work out what you're working in. So if the Lord says do something, you just do it. And you rely on him to help you. And if you mess up like all of us have multiple times, 
You just go to God and say, hey, I messed up. And he's like, it's okay, let's go. It's already been paid for. Let's try again. Let's just do this again. His mercy is new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. So number one, you got to know him. Number two, you need to be serving him. Right? There's so many people in the church today that are not doing that. They're living for themselves. My fear is that many of them are not really born again, that they've never really just given their heart to Christ. They look at their life and they think, well, I'm a pretty decent person. Haven't really hurt anybody, right? Verse 31, now here's another thing. And I'll, and I'll close with this story. It says, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a, sheep, uh, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on the right hand, these are saved people, come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Okay, so this is talking about the second coming. There's going to be sheep and goats. There's going to be people that know God. There's going to be people, they're going to be living with people that don't know God. But when he comes, it's all going to be separated, right? So here we go. And it says, um, for I was, and now he's going to, now this is the lesson, verse 35. For I was hungry and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then shall the righteous, so these are saved people. These saved people, what did they do? They loved people. That's number three. See, then the righteous, were the righteous. The moment you receive Christ, today, for today, Earl's new birthday, today, he became the very righteousness of God in Christ. That Jesus was made sin so that he could be made righteous, just like us. The only thing we had to do to be righteous was believe what God's word said. Isn't that awesome? So then, so, and it says here, then the righteous answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and gave you drink? When did we see you a stranger and took you in or naked and clothed you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and came to you? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Most assuredly I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brothers, you have done it to me. Every time you and I love our brothers and our sisters or help people or are out in the world helping people. Every time you're doing any of that, God is saying, you're doing it to me. So we, we know him, we get born again, we serve him. And it expresses the fact that we love him. Does that make sense? Jesus is spending a whole chapter on this. So it says here, then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, be prepared, prepared for the devil and his angels. Notice hell was never made for man. God never sends anyone to hell. He honors their decision to go there because he can't violate their will. Right? And it says here, For I was hungry and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger. You didn't take me in naked. You didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, look at this, saying, Lord. See, guys, we're living in a time of great deception. These people are saying, Lord, but they never knew him. Wow. So, so this is what you don't do. Don't leave this place and start beating everybody up that you think is not saved. Be led by the Spirit of God, though, to encourage. Everything we do, we don't, 
we don't judge anybody, right? Well, I'm sorry, we do judge one person. Every one of us judge one person. You see that person in the mirror when you look. Man, I can't worry about how you're living because I'm up to here with making sure I'm living the way I need to live, right? Because we're all human. We all have flesh. We work out our own salvation. We don't try to work out other people's. But what we do do is we always let our speech be with grace. We, we love, right? So that we build people up. We encourage people to serve the Lord. We have mercy on people. Well, if God's mercy is new every morning and we're to be imitators of God, then our mercy is to be new every morning. Does that make sense? So this is a huge thing. It says, um, so they answered him, Lord, when, we, when did we see you hungry or thirst or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister unto you? And he shall answer them saying, verily I say unto you, and as much as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. So this, I'll close with the scripture in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, hallelujah. I'm, how am I doing on time here? Hebrews chapter 10, it, in verse 19, it says this. It says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. We can go into the very presence of God because of Jesus, his blood. By a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. What does that mean? 2,000 years ago, Jesus hung on a cross, and the Bible says in Romans, every sin, all of the sin nature, all of the results of the curse of the law were condemned once and for all in his body. Who nailed Jesus to the cross? The Roman soldier? No, all of us did. He died for our sins. Our sins were condemned once and for all in the body of Jesus. Now, with a new and a living way, because he's alive today, we could enter the very presence of God by the blood of Jesus. That's what this is saying. Isn't that good? That's good news. And having a high priest over the house of God. So because of that, it's, we're, we're to do a few things. Number one, let us draw near with a true heart. I love that because now that Jesus died, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. No guilt, no shame, no condemnation. If Satan comes to you and says, shame on you for what you did, you say, no, my shame was put on Jesus and I was made his righteousness, right? So we're to draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So in other words, number one, we are to draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. What else are we to do? Let us hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. In other words, we are to hold fast to keeping his word in our mouth. To, to, the profession means confession. It means saying what God says. We're to hold fast. Why? Because he's faithful. If he promised to meet all of your needs according to his riches and glory, Man, he will be faithful to bring that to pass, but you must hold that word of God in your heart and hold it always coming out of your mouth, right? That's the second thing. The third thing, and let us consider, consider, this means observe fully one another. So that means I don't, I don't live my own life. That means I'm a viable part of my church family. I'm planted in a local church. I'm in relationship, and I'm observing closely my church family. How do I do that? I pray for them. I'm, I'm always coming to church open. Who am, I to, who am I to encourage? Who am I to pray for? Who am I to maybe give money to? Who am I to help? Does that make sense? I mean, in our church, man, do we have a lot of people that help people? It's wonderful. 
So this is what we're to do. We're to observe closely one another and we're to provoke. We're to incite them to do what? To walk in love and to do good works. In other words, we're to encourage our brothers and sisters to walk in love. And what's a good work? To walk by faith. Okay, so, so that's number three. What's number four? Not forsaking the assembling. This, the word assembling means to gather together in one place. When we came and when, you know, we, we chose to obey our governor and our mayor for that short season when they said that they didn't want us meeting as a church uh, and they, you know, they didn't want people to gather for this virus thing. My First Amendment rights as a pastor would say that they can't tell me what to do. However, with our love for people under the direction of the Holy Spirit, we did that, right? But what we did do is we tried to figure out all kinds of other ways to, to meet and gather and do all this stuff. I mean, eventually, you know, remember Easter Sunday? 32 degrees, 40 mile an hour winds, I'm out there preaching. It's raining the whole time. I didn't realize until after I was wiping the pulpit off with my gloves of all the water that was hitting. And then we, I got off the stage after that service and Jeanette comes over to me and she's feeling my coat and my hair. And she's like, Tony, not one drop of rain touched you. I didn't even realize that. Isn't that cool? God is so faithful. But, but what we are to gather together. So when, when they said we could meet, they said on a Monday, I, I forget what date it was, we could meet. So Tuesday morning at 6.30, the men are meeting in a Bible study. We had a room full of guys. Wednesday night we had service. The next Sunday, Channel 7 came out because they wanted to interview, interview me about this. And this is what I told the lady. I said, the reason why, I said, the Christian faith, we are a gathering faith. We gather together in one place. It's a command of our Lord. It's in the Greek language. This is not, this is not a suggestion. It's in the commanded tense. We don't forsake, we don't deserve the ga a desert, the gathering together into one place of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more. See, we have to exhort one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. I wonder if that's written for our day. It absolutely is, isn't it? So I want to encourage you, be just walk in love with your brothers and sisters. Help each other. The Bible says as we love each other, the whole world will know that we're disciples and followers of Jesus. Right? Man, we have some people that are staying home right now because they feel in their heart they need to, some under a doctor's care, some with family, whatever, and we're with those people. Man, I've met with some of them. They are chomping at the bit. Erie and Loretta are like pit bulls. They are, I mean, and God's working miraculously, but they can't wait to get back together here with us. Amen. You know, I'm not talking about that. And you know what? They are, they're in the word. They're serving God. They're, they're, they're ready. I feel real good about that. They're not staying away because they're, you know, they're not staying away because they're choosing to. This is talking about people that have decided, I just don't want to go to church anymore. That's a dangerous thing, especially since, you know, Satan is seeking whom he may devour, right? He's like a lion. What do lions do if they're going after a group of antelope? They go after the weak one, the one that's away from the herd. There's safety, especially as we see the day approaching. Guys, you know what? We're out of here in the rapture of the church. What we may have to go through before the rapture, I don't know. But whatever it is, the word of God is still true. And we have authority and God will protect us. He'll provide for us there. And we'll go through it with joy. Right? I hope this encourages you today. Because this is, this, is, this is getting ready for the last days. Because we're in them. Ready or not. Right? But I don't know about you. All that God's been talking to me lately is about all those prodigal people that are sitting home and some are offended, some have just 
They're just, they're, they're out of the word. They've forgotten who they are. They've been hurt in churches, you know. I mean, everybody's been hurt in church, haven't they? Because, see, the problem with the church is we're full of human beings. <laughs> but, oh, my gosh, have you ever been blessed in the church? Man, so much more. But we need to pray for our brothers and sisters. And then we need to pray for the precious fruit of the earth, these others that don't know the Lord. We can't keep this secret. We were lost, and now we've been given life. Amen?